Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for attending another Aperio Micro Conference. Uh, let's make sure I have control. Yes, um, we have three more scheduled for this, uh, the remainder of the year, and we are in the process of uh, booking uh, speakers for next year. Uh, so um, look forward to announcements about next year's uh, sessions. And if you have a suggestion of a topic or a presenter, please let me know. Uh, you can either email me directly or there's the conference at Aperio email as well. And um, I think today's, I kept rewriting these slides over and over then because there are just more touch points between what Georg, I hope, is going to talk about and some of the activities that Aperio has been doing. And, and the first that came to mind um, are, is Aperio's health metrics that it, that it has done in the past. And I just pulled up Sakai's here to show that um, sort of the topics and the, the data and the, 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 the metrics that were being used and the data collected um, and how I, I think this will mirror a lot of what uh, Georg and uh, Chaos and Baturgy is doing um, around project maturity, sustainability, and so on through health metrics. Um, and I've been using a tool called in for a while, which actually generates a lot of this data. And I, and I shared uh, an email out there with links to, uh, I ran all the projects through it um, just for fun so that folks could see how it sort of interprets the activities and so on. And these are just one screenshot. There's much more information, including the chaos specifics. So this is, again is Sakai. 20-year history of Sakai being reported out of chaos. All the, it's, I know it's too small to read, but um, there's a wealth of, of information in there that's not just the metrics. I think as a perio through our own health metrics activity has, uh, has come to understand um, the assessment of health of a project and community is more than just, you know, how many clicks here and, and commits there and, and you know, numbers and such. So there's all sorts of great things that Chaos has, has put together. Um, and I grabbed some of the, the, uh, the categories there um, that there are metrics specific to each one of these groups. So governance, do you have a license and do you have a management committee and do you have an onboarding process? Things that aren't just about the numbers of, of pull requests and turnaround time on issues and things like that. Um, and I actually compared those to the Aperio. I spelled Aperio wrong. I hope I don't get in trouble. Um, Aperio uh, incubation process. And the incubation process that Aperio uh, has incoming projects go through actually touches on many of the metrics and the criteria uh, that Chaos does. So I, there's great alignment there. And so I think this, this topic will be right down the strike zone for uh, the Aperio community and, and project management committees and maintainers and community management and development folks that are that are trying not only to assess the the, the project's health but also the community. So with that introdu with that introduction of the projects and the activities, I'd like to in introduce Georg Link. Um, I don't even remember when we first met Georg, but uh, uh, it's it's been many years, and when I was at OSI, we reached out to Georg to actually teach one of the uh, open source management um, classes with Brandeis University. Um, he's been an active member of the open source community for years, not only on a technical you know developer side, but around this actual project maturity, project health, um, and he has an academic background as well. So. He's one of the few folks I know who understand the nuance between industrial, commercial, uh, open source software, um, or, or projects that come out of the, out of industry versus those that come out of higher ed. And I think that'll add another element to uh, his description of the metrics and, and health. Um, he's the co-founder of the Chaos Project, which I've ref referenced a couple times. I think Chaos stands for. Uh, community health analytics in open source software, and he's he's uh, works at Baturgia, which is a, a group that that takes these these tools and makes them available to projects um, in a much more managed and uh, controlled way. So take a look at Baturgia um, for your campus and for your project. 
Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Georg. Thank him for, for uh, meeting with us today. And as he mentioned, he's going. He's happy to take questions and comments as uh, he's going through things. I'll monitor the chat for any uh, questions that you may have in case you can't or don't want to uh, speak up. Um, and if you're ready, Georg, I'm going to hand over control to you for presenter. Yes, thank you. And I, I, I'd like to share a little story since you brought up my background of being an open source. And it does, I, I don't want to say taint or bias my view of open source. But it's an it's an interesting story that that explains how I look at at the world in open source. When I was in high school, uh, the first open source project that I really got interested in participating in was the OpenOffice.org project. And at the time, it was a project owned by Sun Microsystems with a very active community. And then Oracle bought Sun Microsystems. And Oracle had plans for the project that they weren't sharing. And so the community was left wondering, OK, what's going to happen to the project? And they've always been promised that at one point, Sun would set up a separate foundation and create that community to self-govern and so on. And the community said, we'll just do it. Oracle is not talking to us. We'll do our own thing, and started the um, the Document Foundation. Because the trademark still belonged to Oracle, they couldn't name the project Open Office, so now it's called LibreOffice. But this this movement of a community of people and volunteers, and there were other vendors that were supporting the ecosystem, went off and created their own project separate from the initial founding organization. That was so powerful and so impactful to my view on open source that when I had a chance to choose my research topic for my PhD, I selected corporate engagement in open source to really understand those dynamics. And that that's my background. And my contributions have been mostly on the community side and on the side of how do we support the developers. Um, I dabbled in software development a little bit, but it's not one of my my favorite things to do these days. So anyway, I just wanted to add that little story of how I came to open source. And Patrick, you had these wonderful, wonderful graphs here and metrics from chaos. And so before I dive into the, the topic that I prepared, I want to say a few things here that the alignment that you found with what Aperio is looking at and what chaos has documented is not by accident. When we started the chaos project in 2017, and at the time I was still working on my PhD and we we're doing qualitative engaged field research. The question was from organizations across the board, how do we understand the health of our open source projects or of the projects that we rely on? Because we, we just had Heartbleed happen. Heartbleed was the vulnerability in open SSL that affected 80% of servers online. And, and so there was a big, big understanding, awakening that we need to understand the health of open source projects so we can manage it better. And, and there was no standard for this. There were no, no definitions for what it means to look at a commit count or does it even matter if how many people are contributing, if everyone is just updating documentation, no one is working on the source code. So there were a lot of questions for how do we look at open source projects and how do we measure them that we started chaos to bring all those voices together and chaos is just the collection that the it, it's the community of practice where we come together to document this and lift everyone up and so that alignment is 
there because we are mostly listening. We're not coming up with strange new things that no one cares about. Chaos is industry, academic, practitioner voices coming together and building out these, these standard vocabulary, standard technology, so that we can all um, work on project health. So uh, I just wanted to, to add that uh, to what you said, Patrick, and thank you for the great introduction. The, the topic for today is project health and academic open source. And I don't have the answers for you. I, what I have is a synthesis of conversations that we've had around this topic. And my understanding and my view of the world. And so if you all on the call are willing to chime in and have a conversation, we can talk about all of these different topics. So what I've prepared are, are a few slides as guideposts that we can use to structure our conversation. And whether you feel comfortable unmuting and to chime in at any point, or have questions and comments in the chat. I really like an interaction with you. So the topic I think of in, first we want to look at open source and academia so that we know what we are talking about. Then project health, how we understand it today and how we understand it in academic open source. I wanna talk about metrics for project health, tying back to what Patrick was already sharing, what Aperio is doing and what we're doing in chaos. And then I have some recommendations for ensuring project health in academic open source. And again, all of this is a few pointers, a few thoughts that I have, and I would much prefer to talk with you and hear your thoughts as well on this topic. So open source in academia, I think of it in three areas. We have the universities as institutions and organizations that use open source in their operations, in the libraries, in for databases, for wherever, just to run as an organization, there is use of open source. Um, and this can be in, in competition to proprietary software. We also have education. Open source shows up in academia in education, whether it is that we are using open source tools um, for statistics and teaching those with the R language, for example, or that we are teaching the uh, Python programming, Python itself is an open source software. And so we have open source as something that we teach and educate on. We also have open source in research. And this is producing research outcomes and investigating our phenomena using open source in the process. Or sometimes we create software as part of our research project, and then we license it with an open source license. And so that's another area where open source, now we are creators of open source. And this is the, the third area. Now, th there might be more nuanced ways that open source shows up. I, I think of it in those three, three high level areas. Now, each of those have different requirements for open source that we are interested in different things. And when we look at project health of open source projects, the way that I define it is as the potential of an open source project to continue developing quality software. We want to have software that has high quality. That means we can use it, trust it, it produces the outputs that we need, and it's there for us in the future. We have seen that technology advances, and if, tech, if the software is not maintained, 
it no longer runs on new operating systems. It doesn't run with new hardware. And also the requirements are changing. Software always needs to be evolving. And unless we have a project or a community behind that project, the software becomes unusable and irrelevant. So looking at project health, we're looking at what it takes to have that. And we know from, from research that there are three things we need for project health. We need the activity in projects. Without activity, there is nothing being done on the project. We need the source code. We need that high quality source code, the interactions, the working on the what, what actually makes the software. And we need different people working on this. And there, there are different threats that we have when any of those are missing. And I, when I think of academic open source, I think of these these threats or challenges to project health in terms of these five areas. And this is the, as I go through these, if you want to add more in the chat or chime up afterwards, I'm sure there are more that I'm not touching on. One of the challenges is long-term support. If we are users of open source as a university, we want to have the software and be able to rely on it. When it's open source, when it's proprietary and we purchase it, then there's a company that we can call up if something fails. We pay them year after year so that they continue to provide updates and maintenance. With open source software, sometimes there is no vendor. Sometimes there is a vendor. And if there is no vendor, then we are self-serving. So instead of paying someone, we need to budget for it and hire developers or uh, um, staff that maintains and runs the software. Uh, another challenge is continuity of contributors. With open source projects, or, or in academia, we have students coming, staying for the term of their project, their, their education, and then they move on. And they might be hired for a semester or two or three to work on a research project that might work on open source, but then they move on. So we have a churn or turnover that impacts any open source that we produce in our research project. Similarly, we have a challenge around continuity of resources. If we have a research project that allows us to create open source software and it's funded for three years, what happens after those three years? Who is going to continue working on that open source software? Especially as we go on to the next one, point, sharing the risk and cost, collaborating. If we have a research project, create a really awesome tool for open source, um, tool that we license as open source, and then other researchers at other institutions pick it up and use it for their own research project. How do we, how do we make sure that after the funding stops and our project ends, that tool can continue to be supported and live on outside. So those are, uh, th those are questions about how do we set up these projects, the governance around them. Um, sometimes we use open source as a way to, to um, share the work that we have done. When it comes to technology transfer, um, there's patenting and licensing and finding customers for it or we can use open source to license more liberally and share the technology and grow impact. Which I do want to think about how we can use metrics to show that impact. And, and that is important for that last step, the reward system at universities. There is for tenure and promotion, a uh, focus often on publications. Writing software is 
something often seen as um, that you do in support of publishing, but it's not seen in, in many places, it's not seen as an activity in itself that is worthy of being recognized. And so changing the culture around that and having open source contributions for tenure is something that can also help with the project health in the future. Now, so I see... There's yes. two questions there. I don't, maybe you just saw them. But uh, uh, one was, uh, does self-service and the first bullet point there, does that relate to uh, project communities uh, doing that work or the adopting organization? So you could, I guess, think of it as, um, is that is that the Linux community doing the work or is it a company or organization that's adopted Linux and versus the vendor who's providing services for one of those two? And do you see a difference in how that might affect the challenges? Yes, I think it does affect the challenge depending on who does the servicing. When I put down this uh, bullet point, the scenario I had in mind is um, a library at the university that is using an open source tool for their catalog. And they, they might choose an open source suite that is available, but they're not hiring uh, a company to set it up, to maintain it, to run it. And so the, the library, the university library is using the software and needs to have someone on staff that keeps an eye on the software, updates it. If there's a update in the community to pull it down, uh, if there's a bug or feature request that they need to work with the community to upstream that. So that is the scenario I had in mind. Do you want to do you want to talk about how that relates to your question and what the other scenarios you had in mind? Um, well, I guess I was thinking, I think often, or perhaps in my experience, that there's often a sort of, bind, those two options of the vendor support and self-service are, are recognized. Um, but the, the self-service that you call it, um, there tends to be a, like you said, oh, we have to hire a developer. And is that the only way to support the, the uh, is that the only option other than a vendor? And then what are the options with perhaps an organization uh, working more closely with the project itself? So yes, they'll have to have some contact person on their campus or in their organization to be part of that community. Um, but obviously the, the skill set of the community is going to be broader than any group of people that can be brought into the to the organization or else they'd be replicating the project. So there becomes a question of how do you effectively and authentically engage at different levels? You might have one person, 10 people working in that library, but um, how are they engaging uh, with the project? And are there best practices for that, for those, that engagement. And later on, perhaps, when you're talking about metrics to assess that, how can our campuses, for example, best engage with the Sakai project or the OpenCast project or the CAS project? These are Aperio projects. How can we foster that engagement for those who have little resources at the library and a lot of resources at the library? Yeah, that's a good question. I personally have a preferred model for how to engage. And that is by having someone on staff that manages the deployment locally and works with the community as liaison, as someone that transfers knowledge that knows what's going on in the project so they can apply it in their own deployment, but then also brings back any any user feedback, any questions back into the community. And they, they serve a dual role, being part of the open source project and being part of the university campus, taking care of the software. That is my 
my preferred option that I would love to see more often. Um, it is possible to just take the software, run it locally, and then not be working with the community actively and be part of it and contribute back. And that starts to create um, friction. At, at least that's what I'm seeing is it starts to create friction where software versions don't get updated, we fall behind. If we make changes locally and don't contribute them back to the community, make sure they get included in future versions. Now we are creating a patch set where it, it becomes harder and harder over time to have the custom features that we put into the software and stay in line with the upstream new versions that are being released. And so we might even choose not to update at all until it, our own system becomes super old and unmanageable. So those are, those are some options. Um, it is also possible to hire contractors or hire someone from the community for occasional work to come and help set it, set things up, um, do a little project, add new features. Um, so yeah, if, if we look at how organizations engage in open source, there are different models like that. Then I see another question is, are there issues related to competition? Can you, um, can you expand what you mean by issues related to competition? Um, long ago, um, I did, when I was working on my own sort of, uh, uh, open source maturity model index, um, at, for fun, I looked up how many open source learning management systems I could find. And I mm -hmm. found there were 256 <laughs> and they varied from sort of little projects that perhaps a grad student was working on for a very niche discipline or something like that. Um, two fully robust Sakai Moodle sort of examples. Um, and so I could, I can understand that there might be architectural or technological differences that drive some folks. They want to work, you know, in a lamp environment or a Java environment, or this is pedagogically, there's different reasons for developing elements. So there might be reasons to have different learning management systems, um, based on a few factors, but at some point those become exhaustive and everyone's sort of working on learning management systems and we're repeating the work. So um, uh, there's two folds. There's the, the, the competition for resources and developers. So it's like, oh, which project am I gonna join? Do I start my own? Do I fork something? That competition. And there's the, uh, that's on the developer side. And then there's the competition on the, the if you will, the consumer side. Oh, we were using this and then this other one has taken over and become the market dominant platform for whatever you know, area that that particular tool is being used. So how, and again, from a metric standpoint, I'd be interested if there's any information that that can be used to sort of say, ah, when a this is the tipping point of when a project goes from hobby and research project to maybe not enterprise level, but you know, is something that's now got a community of practice around it and support around it. Are the, what is that competition like for recruiting folks and for, and buying for those minimal resources or those finite resources? And then what's, what's the competition once the things are out in the wild and be, between adopters? Mm -hmm. So the, in, in those, scenarios where we have many open source projects to choose from. And we have that with any technology, learning management systems or operating system, distributions of Linux. There are so many to choose from um, that we can use metrics in our decision, which one to, to back, which one to rely on. And well, there are some metrics that immediately come to mind. I'm interested in how active is the project? How frequently are updates being made and new features added, but also 
how is that activity spread out across different developers, across different institutions? Who is backing the development? Who is behind it? If it's just the grad student that developed a really awesome tool for their course, um, what happens when that grad student goes? That, that's the bus factor metric that we want to be mindful of. Whereas a system like Moodle that has been around for a really long time and has, I, I don't know their numbers, how many developers they have, then we can be more confident that there will be still development and ongoing support in the future. And when it comes to competition also, there are tools like Moodle that have an ecosystem of service providers around them, which is a healthy sign that the project is around to stay. And even if our point of contact, the organization we decide to work with goes away, the technology can stay the same and we just hire someone else to help us with, with the software. So organizational diversity as a metric is in interesting to choose open source projects. And what we also see in open source is there, there are many different approaches to solving the same problem. And the awesome thing in open source is everyone can put it out there. Here's my solution. And then we, we see a standardization occurring at some point where a lot of, but where one project or a few projects get the most mind share and, and get a lot of attention and people start going in with those solutions as the default and the, the pie is then divided into a few big pieces. While all the small ones are still there and they have their own fan base and users, often there are some open source projects that just get a lot more attention. So popularity metrics is another one to look at. And so the, to know what we actually want to look for, what metrics to look at, we can follow a goal question metric approach. For this, we need to understand First, the context that we're in. Are we users of the software? Do we want to contribute to the project? Are we creating the project and we want to build a community around it? And knowing that background helps us decide which metrics to choose. In Chaos, we have defined more than 70 different metrics. And I don't, I'm not going to talk about specific metrics here as part of these slides because it really depends on the context and which ones you want to apply. So I want to more um, talk at the higher level about the idea of how we would go about applying metrics. And there, there are different kinds of metrics that we can look for. We have the trace data that we can analyze. This is accidentally created data as uh, someone who is makes a contribution to open source, I create a entry in an issue tracker, letting everyone know here, I'm working on this. This is what I'm planning to do. Here's my solution. I'm creating a pull request or a code change that is being reviewed. Um, we have the review history, mailing list archive in the Git log where we have the history, the version history of the software that is created as a way to manage the project. And we can analyze that trace data. It's like the footsteps that we leave behind and we can start looking at. And so we, we can look at the contributions data to see who is active in the project. What are they working on? How is that collaboration happening? Or is there even collaboration? Are the different contributors just working in their own corners of the project and they don't overlap in the files that they edit or um, when there are issues, they don't talk to each other. So we, we, we can understand that contributor community through the trace data, which is interesting to, especially if we are the creators of the open source project and we want to know the, how, how we are, well, we are doing in building a community and inviting others to contribute. 
having those metrics helps us make the case that yes, we are on the right track or no, we actually have barriers. When someone comes and makes a, opens an issue or code contribution and we don't respond, we can see that in the data, then people don't come back. If, if they're ignored, the, the problem that they wanted to work on no longer is relevant to them and they don't come back two weeks later. So having metrics around that helps us manage and grow projects. We can also have usage and adoption data. And this is interesting for, for writing funding requests, for showing to our funders that the work we're doing in open source, we have this many downloads, we have this many um, different organizations using the tool that we created. We are supporting these different projects. Some of this we can collect through uh, automated means, but we might also have to go with qualitative analysis and discover where open source is being used, who is working on it, what are they working on? Um, and, and so going around and surveying, this is especially something when we look at it at the university level um, and want to understand what is open source at our institution. We may not even know all the open source projects that all the faculty and students and staff are working on. So we might have to send out a survey say, hey, please give us your GitHub username so we can look at what activity you have in open source or please identify the projects that you're working on so that we can use the data to tell compelling stories. And some of the stories are not in the data that we can see. We might have to talk to the developers, to the students, to the staff, to other institutions that are using the tool to discover what are the interesting stories around our open source projects. Because data is, and, and the metrics are only a means to an end. It is not that we want to have, ooh, we grew by 20%. Unless we use that for something, it, it doesn't matter. I see another question popped up. So, I feel like I'm hogging the mic here, but uh, hopefully people will be emboldened by all my questions, or they'll just be so tired of hearing my voice, they'll want to hear someone else's and chime in. <laughs> um, but following up on that, you got a little bit of, into the education specific realm but do you have you has chaos or have you discovered education specific metrics that are that you that are more prevalent or relevant um within open source projects that emerge out or are developed out of education or are there differences in the data that is collected or that is captured from or created from educational institutions versus non-educational institutions for the same metric? So that's an ongoing conversation and discovery process. I wish I could already tell you this is what we've found. Uh, we have a working group in chaos that focuses specifically on the academic context. And we are looking at the building out metric models where we say these are of all the metrics that we have the ones relevant for this specific context and the, what i'm showing you on the slide here is the way that this academic working group in chaos is structuring the conversation and i'm i'm showing this as a as a primer there's not enough time to go into all the details but if this is interesting i invite you to join the working group's work. So go, following the goal question metric approach, we want to start at the top with the context. What, what do we want to achieve as a university? Um, one is research excellence. One is research translation. One is education, and then also distribution and community. Those are the high level um, high level goals that are keep coming up in conversations. And then 
we can go down underneath that on what is its specific need that we want to do. So for research excellence as a big goal and concern, we might want to look at improving research reproducibility and replicability. Or we might want to look at correlating open source activity with research funding. And there are different things that we can do with this work. Um, and I have an example here, and th this is still early days conversations um, where we don't have all the answers yet. We're still working through this. Uh, but to give you an idea of how we are approaching this. So for the research excellence category and looking at correlating open source activity with research funding, we're starting to think about, okay, where can we get data to answer this question? And one approach is mining databases for mentions of software repositories like Science Miner, um, finding mentions in research papers. We also have uh, the idea of a repo browser where we can have the repositories relevant to our university and seeing how many people are in, in that repository. Or we can look at uh, sponsored research and we identify that open source activity by making it a part of the submission step. So when someone creates a research grant, then we ask them as a university, hey, does this include any open source work? Tell us about it. So, so we start collecting data. We have to come up with strategies around how do we get that data? And then we can use that to go for bigger grants, for highlighting the good that we're doing, for showing the translation. If, if we, and with translation, I'm, I've come to understand this as the work that we are doing at the university and the ideas that we are creating and what we are doing in open source is being used by organizations, by other universities, and is having an impact outside of our research team. So that's that's something that I like to think about. Um, Benito asked or, or stated an interest in learning more about the working group. The working group, I, I can pull up the information and share it here in the chat. We have the here is the meeting minutes document. So on our website, um, there's a way to find this. This document has information on when the last meetings were. Uh, and on the Chaos website, we also have a calendar when next meetings are coming up. And so the, I'm looking right now, we have University Open Source Metrics Working Group next time on Wednesday. The way we, um, and this is US Central time. The, the way that we are structuring work in chaos is that we have, um, chaos as a whole responsible for creating metric definitions on the one side and software on the other side that work is structured in working groups and for the metric side we have a working group that is focused on defining the metrics and putting them into templates and making sure they follow our standard for they have to have a name and a description and how to collect the data and what are different objectives that we have for using the metric. And then we have context working groups like the one focusing on the university context that are talking about how do we apply this metric in our context. And we have other contexts on organization, um, OSPOS, open source program office in industry. Um, we have one that looks at the app ecosystem. So GNOME and KDE and all of those projects around it. 
and applying metrics in that category, in that area. And in those conversations, sometimes we might decide, hey, we are interested in knowing this part about open source projects and we don't have a metric for it yet. And so then it goes back to the common metrics working group that defines the metric. The meetings are organized around, um, or, or these working groups are organized around meetings and we meet on Zoom. And that's where most of the work is happening. From the calls, we sometimes take some action items for working on a document or writing something out. Um, and then we bring that back to the next meeting. But a lot of discussion happens during these meetings. So to participate in that, I encourage you to join a call. The next University Open Source Metrics Working Group call is Wednesday, September 20th at 11 Central Time. So I want to leave you with a few thoughts. This is recommendations for ensuring project health that I see based on my conversations I have with faculty and staff at universities and with chaos and others in, in the space. Um, one is to track open source at the university and project level. If we know how our open source projects are doing, then we can tell the stories, we can provide support, we, 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 we can do something about it. If we don't even know what open source exists in our institution, then we can't manage it. Right? Like uh, Peter Drucker said, if you don't manage, measure it, you can't manage it. So that's why metrics are important. We want to tell compelling stories um, of the impact that we are having with open source. Open source is a means to an end. It's not, well, for some, I, I'm sometimes on that spectrum as well, where I think open source is awesome and we should do it because it's the moral thing to do and it's right. But often it's, it's not the end goal. We use open source because it reduces barriers to collaboration. It allows us to share our work more freely. And so we want to support those goals and we need to tell the stories around how we achieve that. That's why we need the metrics and the data. And it helps us to then go after more funding or we put into our funding that we are building a community so that we can sustain the project after the research project ends. And we report back to the funder on how well we've been able to recruit other organizations using or working on our tool. And then we also want to, and I think it would be fantastic. This last one is really a wish that I have, uh, change the mindset. And this is not just an academic open source, this is an open source in general. That there's the mindset of the creator of an open source project getting all of the praise. And if we uphold people that create new open source projects, then we are not valuing the long-term maintenance and support that is required. And once something is created, let's start reusing it. So changing that mindset to valuing more people that step up and continue to maintain and improve something that already exists can help project health at in open source in academic open source as a whole so and th this is challenging even in in research um, i know often someone who has a new idea and comes up with a new theory gets a lot of praise and recognition and then someone who improves on it and, and uses it in a in, in a new context and helps people with that, they, they don't get as much attention anymore. And we have the same thing in, in open source. So that, that, that is my personal view and my personal wish list. Um, I know we have about five minutes left. I'm happy to hear more questions. Uh, Patrick, if you have something or if anyone else has something. So I, I guess one of the issues that I feel is common is that open source suffers through the procurement processes that most universities employ when identifying 
uh, new platforms, services, software, tools, whatever it may be. And uh, because open source projects, while they might have commercial providers that are supporting your example of Moodle or uh, for us Sakai, um, it's it's not often that those companies will respond to RFPs. Um, uh, and the projects themselves don't have the resources to respond either. So are there examples or could there be uh, a practice of using chaos to identify mature, sustainable, healthy projects for campuses? Um, in the same way, if you look at an RFP, it asks all these sorts of questions about the health of the company and the, and the features and so on. Um, is there anything like that that's happening that, that, or could there be, is there a, a vision of that if it's not happening now? Uh, I don't know your thoughts on that would be interesting. Yes. I, I think that would be fantastic to arrive at that place. There's nothing in place right now. <laughs> and, and I think that is a, a challenge. Um, in fact, there is a, a, an organization that we were just talking in the chaos project with, um, they're called scout flow. Um, and their goal is to make open source solutions more competitive against, com um, proprietary commercial offerings. Um, and we were talking with them about integrating chaos metrics into their their platform where so different alternatives to proprietary solutions are offered um, and providing a health project health score if that helps university procurement i i don't know this is something unless there is a champion in the organization in the university the, the projects, the, you know, the university, uh, the, the open source projects and communities don't have the setup. They don't have the, the sales machine that organizations have. So I find it really difficult um, to see how that would work. We've seen it in politics. Um, if we look at something like the example in, in Munich in Germany, I know they even developed the uh, Linux, the, their own Linux distribution for the administration. But then once the political will faded, Microsoft just got a foot in the door and things went back to how things were before. Um, I see Benito wrote that Unicorn is a big proponent of uPortal. We often respond to RFPs. I think it has helped with uPortal sustainability. Uh, do you want to talk? A little bit about your experience, Bonito. I see you only have listening mode on right now. So if you want to speak up, you would have to leave audio and come back with the microphone. I think we're also at the end of our time. Yep, we do. Um, <laughs> so that's what Benito said. Um, yeah, I, I want to sell. We do have very active, we're fortunate, a pair is fortunate to have very active commercial affiliates who do provide you know, do do a lot of work in raising awareness um, and and helping campuses discover and and understand not just the tools like uPortal, but open source mm -hmm. itself. Um, and I think that has led to our sustainability. Um, so, I I guess one of the I guess I'm looking at that as as Unicon goes to address and and reach out to campuses having these metrics would be a way to um, comfort or show off the maturity and capabilities of not only the the project but the community to give because campuses just don't have that assessment model it's like oh well you're a billion dollar company you must be good yeah. right so what's the equivalent metric that um that we could help unicon next time they go out to to, to introduce you portal to some some campus that they say, oh, okay, this is because these metrics are this. Um, it gives yeah. us, you know, we're more secure in our decision making or confident in our decision making. 
Yeah. And I, I work in sales. We can talk about this much longer, what it takes to get through the procurement process. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think it, it can help to have good use cases and have stories and the metrics about the project um, that back up that, hey, this is not just a project that will go away, but it has a lot of backing and development behind it and organizations using it. And yeah. So we are, we are at the top of the hour, uh, but uh, on the recording, we have four more minutes. So if folks have a last question uh, before they need to get off or um, a last comment, anything they want to add to the chat, uh, please feel free to do so because um, we do have three minutes left. Um, but I would like to thank uh, Georg for not only attending today, um, but all the work that Chaos is doing. I think it's one more tool that open source communities can uh, use in not only that self-assessment to, to sort of look at where they're doing well, maybe where there's some gaps, help tune their projects and communities. But it's also, I really do think, a tool that if it became a sort of standard reference point uh, for organizations to look up that project using chaos metrics, and, and that might help foster adoption so that they're getting the confidence as they do that analysis, looking for new tools and such. So thank you, Georg, um, for that work and for your time today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I, yeah, I, I hope you learned something. That's always uh, my something that I'd like to do. And I'm happy to continue the conversation uh, in the Chaos Project. Do join us on the community calls, the university working group is open to anyone. If you have time, join us there. And otherwise, I'm available on LinkedIn and email. You can reach out to me. Happy to connect. OK, great. And I'll share your contact information when we send out information about the recording. Uh, thanks again. And uh, we'll talk to folks next month.